Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Chats with Champions at the Skidamka Library. Chats has a 15-year history of presenting programs that span the interests of all segments of the community. Our next chat is Thursday, July 13th at 10 a.m., when former Senator George Mitchell will speak and sign his two most recent books. Uh, next week, on Thursday, July 20th, at 12 noon, New York Times bestselling author Christina Baker Klein will talk about her new book, A Piece of the World, a fictional, fictional account of the world of the woman immortalized in Andrew Wyatt's haunting painting, Christina. Chats is sponsored by Sherman's Main Coast Bookshop. Today we are happy to have nationally noted artist and sculptor, sculptor Jack Vessery. His talk is entitled World Wood Collaboration, Making Art with Others. <coughs> World Wood Day is a cultural event celebrated annually on March 21st to highlight wood as an eco-friendly and renewable biomaterial and to raise awareness on the key role wood plays in a sustainable world. Starting in 2013, World War Day celebrates, celebrations were held in Tanzania, China, Turkey, and Nepal, and in 2017 in Long Beach, California, involving participants from over 100 countries and regions. World culture is a platform and out, outlet for everyone to share and connect in different and various forms and mediums of wood culture. These talented artists and craftsmen not only create beautiful art for the cities they meet in, but also experience the teamwork that cross different races, religions, and cultures. To them, the language of art is beyond any spoken language. Their projects aim to encourage new ideas, approaches, and possibilities through teamwork, skill sharing, and cultural bridge building to emphasize the beauty of wood and to highlight woodworking as a global language. Jack has lived in Maine for over 25 years, <coughs> striving to create an illusion of reality. His vision and inspiration begins with repetitive patterns derived from the golden mean or divine proportions. The marriage of pattern, form, and proportion conveys a sense of growth within each of his pieces. His work is in numerous public and private collections, including the Detroit Institute of Art, the Contemporary Art Museum in Honolulu, Yale University Arts Gallery, the Carnegie Museum, and the Peabody Essex Museum. He was Maine Arts Commission <coughs> Fellow for 2000 and winner of Sculptural Pursuit's third annual sculpture competition in 2006. He has received the title of Master Craft Artist and Lifetime Membership from the Maine Crafts Association in 2011. He has lectured on design and concept within, the work, within the, his work in France, Italy, England, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. He has been included in over 20 publications and his work is in 100 artists of New England. It is my pleasure to introduce Jack. Thank you for all coming. I think it's the same people that were here when I spoke the last time eight years ago, or nine years ago. So thanks for coming again. Um, this morning I, I'm going to go through a couple different things that I've done, but all in collaboration. Uh, so I'm going to start with some collaborative work I've done with other artists, but then go right into the projects that I've done with the World Wood Day uh, events, which to me are the most exciting. Um, and as Karen just said, they've been all over the world, and I've been to all but one of them. I didn't go to the one in Tanzania. So, uh, so we'll go through that, and hopefully we'll have enough time to get through all of it. Also, uh, before you leave, I did bring some work on the request of someone who my wife saw yesterday in her office, and <laughs> is he bringing work? And I said, well, I guess I am now. So, there are a few pieces, uh, most of them are collaborative pieces, and uh, we'll talk about that at the end as well. Um, I'm not doing a presentation in French. <laughs> so, um, collaboration to me is very important, 
because when I collaborate with other artists, I get something out of it every single time. Whether it's a successful collaboration or not, something comes out that is important to me. I don't know about the other person, but for me it's usually something that I've, I've learned. Uh, a new challenge, a new way of thinking, a new way of doing what I do in my own work. So, working with others, I call it playing with other, others because it's a lot of fun. Um, someone will give me a form that they normally make and then I have to try to create something different that's going to be still recognizable as my work and their work. And so these are a few examples. Um, these are from people from all over the, the world, actually, because one of those is from uh, Germany. Uh, I won't go into a lot of details on the pieces, but just so you get an idea, uh, these are collaborations with a artist, Mike Lee from Hawaii. One of the pieces in the, in the photographs here is here for you to see because my wife owns it. Uh, we actually made collaborations together and said, well, we should make one for each of our families. So that way he has one and I have one. Um, the, the largest piece, though, is a collaboration. It's a three-way collaboration that actually traveled all the way around the world because it was done by an artist in Germany, Hans Weisslag. Um, he sent the piece to Hawaii, and then Mike Lee in Hawaii sent it to me in Maine, and then I had to send it to a gallery in California. So it went around the world and plus some. <coughs> Um, and then this is a, one of my favorite collaborations with a, another wood artist, and this is the same artist, Hans Weisslag from Hildesheim, Germany. Um, the challenge of taking something that is very, um, very structured, very geometric, and then adding organic components to it opened doors for me in my own work. Uh, this is collaborations by chance. These were. Uh, cast-offs after a demonstration from a friend of mine from Canada. Uh, Michael Hasselick from Saskatchewan was here in Maine and demonstrating and working in my studio showing some people how he does his work and made these labels and I said, oh, these are going to be collaborations. Mm -hmm. So that was how that came about. Uh, lots of fun. Collaboration with uh, Graham Priddle from New Zealand and more favorite one of mine is this one. Uh, and he didn't know we were collaborating because he actually left these forms with another friend of ours in Chicago, an artist named Ben Fo. And I was at his home because I was there demonstrating and he said, uh, I said, what are you doing with these forms from Graham? And he said, nothing. I don't, I don't have time to work on them. You take them. So I did. And Graham said, gee, I didn't know we were collaborating. <laughs> Um, and I, I like to show this group of, uh, of images of spin tops because probably the most uh, recognized collaborations in my field were, have been with this woman from uh, Washington State, Bonnie Klein. We started doing collaborations because we would be demonstrating or teaching at the same location and she said, why don't we do a piece together? So we started doing that, but we would always donate the piece to the auction at the event or something that was going to raise money for education. And uh, this was actually, I think, the fourth or fifth piece that we had done together. And it was because we were going to be in Louisville, Kentucky, and there was an exhibit connected with the symposium there, which was at the Louisville, the Louisville Slugger Museum. So being baseball related, I thought this was a good idea. So, uh, so with a lot of back and forth, we discussed what we would make and we made this piece. Uh, this piece, uh, before this piece, the pieces that we had made uh, had auctioned for $1,800, $3,700. And these are just little toys made out of wood, which I always thought people were crazy to spend 1000 versus even 3700 But this one went to auction, and um, before I could hear the numbers in the auction, I heard $11,000, and I said, that can't be right. I think he meant $1,100. Uh, it ended up auctioning for $11,800. Uh, 
And someone said, well, you can't, you're not going to beat that. And I said, well, I think we can top that. <laughs> and the next year we made this piece for the following auction, also an educational benefit auction, and uh, this one went for $20,000. And it's six inches tall. So, um, the, the, the following year, I was asked by a, a gentleman from uh, Virginia who was selling historical woods. He said, would you consider doing a collaboration with some of my woods, with Bonnie? So, um, here what is what, what you see is the raw pieces of several different collaborations with Bonnie. Uh, the lower shot is actually the, um, the baseball piece, so you can see what it looks like before it's been carved. But the one on the upper right is the one you'll see next, which is, this is all made of historical woods from um, the D.C., uh, Northern Virginia area. So some of them are historical because of Civil War era. Some of them are uh, Mount Vernon woods, so George Washington. Um, there's even a piece of boxwood that came from um, Andrew Jackson's estate. So there's several different pieces of wood in this project. And this is what it ended up looking like. Didn't do so well in the next auction. You know, it was, it was 2008 and, and the recession hit, so it only went for 11.5. <laughs> so disappointing. Um, and then the last collaboration with Bonnie, which uh, I still have uh, in, in our possession, is the Four Seasons, which was for a, uh, a book and a, and a traveling exhibit called Boxes and Their Makers, which was odd to me that I was invited to do uh, boxes, a box exhibit because I don't make boxes. They said, but you make boxes with Bonnie, because these are all threaded box tops. So not only is it a spin top, but it opens up like the others. And there's the pieces open. And um, Karen mentioned uh, before we started, she said, do you still do the thing with the paintings? I said, yeah. So uh, the lower image is the actual working palettes that it takes to make those pieces. So I like to include that with the work, because it does tell a story of what it takes to, to color a piece. So even like the spring piece, which is all blue, when you look at the palette, there's a lot more happening there than just blue, uh, because there's multiple layers of color. Okay, so now we get into the, the what I think is the more exciting stuff, collaboration with multiple artists, um, and sometimes more than 20 artists. Now, this was the first large collaboration that I was involved in that was not a, uh, what we would consider a free-for-all. Many places in the United States and abroad, people will do collaboration events where you have a week-long period or some time frame where you put a bunch of artists together, you give them any resources you can find, and you say, make whatever you want. And in those cases, uh, a lot of times what will happen is somebody will make something or do something to an object, put it down, and then somebody else grabs it, continues the process. And a lot of times those are very funky, uh, eclectic projects, but it's a fun type of process, and you do learn from it. But in this case, I was invited in uh, 2013 to be part of a collaboration where it was 20 artists, there was 10 artists from, that were international, and 10 Irish artists who had, they, they all had to apply to be part of the project. And the, the task at hand was build your impression of a Irish stone wall. And the odd thing was that most of these artists were wood turners, not wood sculptors. So they were out of their, their depth. They were just, you know, floundering because they didn't have a lathe to work on and nothing was going to be round. So it was uh, a big challenge. But we had seven days to build this project. And it ended up being um, what you see, a stone wall, and all made of wood. And it's 21 feet long and three feet high at the highest point. This was exhibited in an uh, uh, art center in Carlow, Ireland, 
for three months and then moved to the uh, Terminal 1 at the Dublin airport and lived there for a year and a half. From that project, um, IWCS, the International Wood Culture Society um, that runs the World Wood Day events, they actually had sponsored, co-sponsored this event and had in, sent us an artist. So there's one um, Asian gentleman in the middle and he was the Chinese master who was sent by IWCS to work with us. They thought the project went so well that they said, would we consider doing something like this for World Wood Day? And then um, one of the artists in this group was asked to lead a project in China where we had 14 days and we had 20 artists, uh, 10 international again and 10 Chinese, and we were put to the task of doing a project on the theme of harmony. Um, and I have a, a very quick little video that you can watch that kind of gives you an idea of what happened in China. There's also a longer video online. So in this project, we ended up building two sculptural objects in 14 days. Um, part of the international team, we had a 65-year-old carver from, ta from Tanzania, Johanna Martin, who spoke only Swahili, and no one told us. So thanks to Google, we all started learning Swahili. We had to explain to him every day that he didn't need to pack his bag because we weren't leaving yet. Every morning he would come to breakfast with his luggage. And, and it was so hard to get him to understand that, but, uh, but it was great to work with somebody who had been doing this all his life. Um, he made more money working with us for 14 days than he would normally make in a year in his own country. So uh, that, that dichotomy between somebody like myself and somebody like him was pretty uh, staggering and amazing to learn about. Uh, but we did build these two objects. Um, it ended up that because of the language barrier with the Chinese, and because none of the Chinese artists spoke any English, um, and we already had the difficulty of Swahili and German and a couple other problems with our own group of internationals, uh, we said, why don't we do this? Why don't we each group, each art group of 10, build an object, and then we'll swap them. And so that's what we did. So the internationals built the arch, the Chinese built the gateway, and then swapped, and the, uh, the international group actually did the lattice work that's hanging in that archway. Uh, the interesting thing about the arch is that it's made out of wood that is over 10,000 years old. It's ancient cypress that's being dug up on the Hainan Islands and they're using a radar to find the logs that are in the mud, and then they dig them up and they're worth a fortune. So they let us work with this uh, precious wood. So after uh, 2014 and doing this event, which uh, I ended up being in, in China for that uh, project for 34 days, because they kept adding things. They kept saying, well, you'll stay and do this, and you'll do that. And so we ended up doing 
not only this collaboration project and World Wood Day events, we ended up teaching um, at uh, one of the universities in Beijing at the end. So that was, that was great. So then they said, the next year they said, uh, we're doing another project. Now, they normally invite us for these things in January for an event that's happening in March of the same year, which is really difficult. So um, that's what happened in China, and then we didn't hear anything, and all of a sudden January 1st came around of 2015, and I was um, asked to actually lead the next project, and that was going to be in Eskishir, Turkey. Um, and I said, well, yeah, I think I can do that, short notice, but I can do that. And said, good, can you come with us to Turkey tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> I said, how about in a week? And they said, okay. So on like January 20th, I jumped on a plane and flew to Turkey to scout out the project that we would do in March. Um, and here's a quick video of that. <clears throat> and Turkey is an amazing place. Uh, if you've never been, it's, it's definitely worth a trip. In Eskishir, Turkey, we, um, we were given the challenge of a theme of just the word bridge because of where Turkey is, bridging the two continents. Um, we quickly said, well, we'll call it the Kopru Project because that's the bridge in Turkish. And uh, one of the artists who uh, I became very good friends with from Turkey gave me a quote from um, Yunus Emery, who was a famous poet and scholar of Turkey and from Eskishir that said that uh, the world was left to no one, basically. And so that was our theme of this project. Um, we had more than 20 artists. We only had five from Turkey, but we had 20. They wanted us to have 30 artists, and I said, that's impossible. I, I can't manage 30 artists. I said, 25 would be the maximum, but let's try for less. So we ended up having 23 actually show up because two had to cancel last minute, so that helped out. Uh, with the challenge here was the material and the time. So we, in Turkey, they have, they have forests, but they have mostly pine forests. So this is a black pine, and they said, can you work with this? And I said, we can work with anything. You know, and most of the artists were like, I've never carved on pine before, but we'll try it, and it worked. Uh, it was fine. We designed the sculpture and spent 
most of our time building a sculpture and then had to move the project to a, um, a separate facility which was where it was supposed to live. And the day, a day and a half before we were to install it in this building, the assistant mayor came to me and said, I think it should be outside. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So we had to push our, our finish date up by three days because they wanted it mounted outside, finished for the opening of the World Wood Day events. We were told we could carve till the last day of the World Wood Day events, so that cut us down by three days. So um, there's 90 feet of carving, lineal feet of carving on this project, and it was all carved in three days. Uh, so it took, the majority of our 14 days was actually building the sculpture because we had to cut every one of those sticks to a taper and then bolt them together. Um, we also had to do metal fabrication. Uh, it, was, it was a great challenge, but it was also a great project and we had a great group of people. Now, when you work with 23 artists together, that's a lot of ego. So I learned as the, the lead artist on this project that the first thing I said to everybody is you have to leave your ego at the door. And none of us will work alone. So you cannot put your signature on this piece. Uh, you cannot do a piece that's your work by yourself. Uh, even the little faces that were carved on the ends, the, on the buttresses of the, uh, the sculpture, I said, you know, if you have an idea, great, but work on the idea with another, at least one other artist. So not one single element was done by one person alone. Um, and that's what makes these things very successful. So no one can go and say, look, I did this object. And that way it's, it's the unity of everyone working together. Um, there is a, a half hour documentary that you can see online on this project and the following project uh, that is the one I led in Nepal, which is coming up. Um, good group of people. And with the, the ego issue, out of 23 artists, we only had one person who didn't buy into the whole idea of this is a good idea, collaboration can, can work. Um, and he, he just basically said, I refuse to be part of the project. And uh, we said, okay, you know, take your tools and go home. <laughs> so um, last year, I was asked again to lead a project, and I said, um, I'd be happy to lead the project, but I think it would be healthy for these projects if, um, if I co-led the project, and then maybe you would think about my co-leader as the um, leadership component for a following project. So we were asked to go to Nepal, um, we went to Kathmandu. We also had to do a scouting project to uh, check out the, the situation. So my friend Killian O'Celebrant from Ireland, who was my assistant in Turkey, he and I flew to Nepal and checked it, everything out, found materials and sites and whatnot to work, and then uh, went back with the team in March. And. Uh, the idea of brick by brick, which didn't really become the, the initial part of our project, was because of uh, an idea that I've worked on since the first project, which was having thousands of artists send a brick to a location and then putting them together and making a brick wall, just like the stone wall. But you could have people from all over the world be involved. Uh, and the director, Mike Howe from IWCS, he said, you know, that idea you have, uh, could we do that in Nepal? And I thought, well, we could probably do something like that. So with very short notice, again, less than three months, we contacted people and asked them to send us wooden bricks. I hand carried 28 bricks from North America for the project. Um, I had an artist on the team from France who brought eight. We had somebody from Malaysia who brought a, about a dozen different bricks. So these were all wooden bricks that could be implemented into a project. Now, they became a project, but separate from the one you're going to see. Um, so we found a location in Nepal that, uh, that was a school property. It was a private school for underprivileged children. And the headmistress uh, agreed to, which we were amazed she agreed to let us work there because 
she kept saying, well, what are you going to do? And we kept saying, we don't know. <laughs> we'll tell you at the end. And so she t took trust in us and uh, graciously let us work at her school yard. Um, the other part of the brick thing is that this is after a, a devastating earthquake. And everywhere you looked, there was, um, there was rubble and ruins and you know, kids playing with bricks. And there was stacks of bricks that they had taken out of the piles to reuse all over the place. So we were fortunate enough to go to the, um, the Royal Dubar Square of Bhaktapur, which is about 15 miles from downtown Kathmandu. And this is one of four royal squares in the valley. So we actually walked through the square every morning to go to the school to work on the project. So if that wasn't good enough, um, I don't know what else could have been better. Uh, there, you see the, the there's a, a stone temple in the background behind these artists. Um, you see the wood pagoda well, right to the left. There's a there's a rubble. That's that used to be a a stone structure almost as tall as that pagoda, which is now being restored. Uh, buildings were propped up with sticks all over the place. Um, it was crazy. Uh, there's the sticks holding up the that's the royal palace of Bhaktapur. Uh, these two young people are the children who lived at the schoolyard. Their father was the school guard, so he guarded the gate for the school. He wore a uniform and everything, and he and his family lived right there on the property. So we spent days with them. Uh, and one of them spoke English pretty well, uh, the young girl, and the boy did not, but, but we figured out how to converse with him and learned some Nepali language, uh, but they were the, the smiling faces that we saw every single day. We started the project in Nepal with a ceremony. They said, the artist said, before we started, they said, we have to do a ceremony to bless all the tools. And I said, okay, well, that would be, that would be really great. Um, how long will that take? And they said, oh, several hours. And all I did was look at my watch and go, we only have so many days that we can work on this. Okay, let's bless the tools. So it took several hours. It was very moving. They, um, they used incense and rice and marigold flowers, and they blessed all the tools. And they said it was so that no one would get hurt on the project. Of course, right after they finished, somebody banged their head going through one of the short doors. <laughs> butterflies on their head um, but but I said that was really moving and they said yeah we left part of it out <laughs> and I said oh really and they said yeah we decided maybe the the sacrifice of the live chicken or goat wouldn't have been so good I said yeah thanks for that um, and then so a woman the, who's the, doing the, the carving this is a cousin of one of the uh, master carvers of the village his father is the, the master carver. He's the apprentice master carver of Bhaktapur. But this is his cousin, and uh, she would dress like this every day. So that's pretty, pretty wild in itself. And uh, these are the school kids. So as we would finish building part of the project, they would come and test it out for us. Now, we, um, we were working in a schoolyard, and they had no playground. And so we said as a team, we said, what do you think of the idea of building a sculptural object that is interactive? Basically, it's a playground. <laughs> and everybody went, yeah, that's what we're going to do. So that was the first decision we made. Then we had to design it. Um, fortunately, we were able to build two st structures uh, because there was another project going on in Nepal where they had started building a pagoda building frame that they couldn't use. And they said, if you guys want to use it, we, we, we'll give you the frame. So we took the frame and made it into another piece of playground. Um, and that's what these, these girls are standing on right there. We also involved every level of, of student at the school. This school has um, as young as four years old. 
So they have like a nursery school and they go up to teenagers. So um, we had the whole nursery school class come and we did their handprints on one of the beams of the structure. And then we carved all their handprints out. We also asked a group of, uh, I think there were fifth graders, approximately that age, uh, to design together, two students together, design the face of a brick. And then we gave those designs to the artists on the team and had them carve those designs. So each of these bricks that you see the students looking at, it's sort of in a honeycomb pattern there, um, had been worked on by at least four different artists. And many of them asked, how do we become artists? And I said, well, you, you are artists. You just did artwork together. You know, and you're collaborative artists because you just did it with three other people. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We had to do a lot of hard work. Um, if you notice my sledgehammer there, I'm, this is the existing playground for the nursery school. It was broken glass, broken bricks, and a big chunk of cement with a metal pipe sticking. Um, and I said to the guard for the school, I said, can, I, can you get me a sledgehammer? And he brought me this sledgehammer. It was a sledgehammer head on a stick. So that's what we had for tools, uh, for removing debris. Uh, but we had a blast. Uh, you know, everyone was very grateful, thankful for what we did. And, uh, and the projects were, were usually successful. So there is the two structures. Oh, sorry. Uh, the one structure ended up being where the, the two kids that live at the property would do their homework in the morning. <laughs> and the second structure, the larger structure, which you'll see again in a second, is that uh, whale bone type structure, which um, is anchored with a lot of cement and two metal pipes at the end and a lot of cables but it became a interactive playground. So uh, it has many components to it. Uh, all the panels on the front side are carved by the artist. We didn't have enough time to carve both sides. We also used um, climbing rope that was retired from uh, Mount Everest. We were able to find some climbing rope that couldn't be used anymore. And so we bought that at a, at a very good price and included that into the structure. Uh, and as a side note, um, all the artists that I've worked with, that I've seen since this project, now wear a band of that piece of rope, just like I do. I've made each of them a, a bracelet out of the project. So, uh, so as I see them over the years, I'll be giving those out, and uh, hopefully they appreciate that. So we, uh, we basically finished that project. Um, and, and because we couldn't move that project as we did in the past years to the World Wood Day events because it was a permanent structure for the playground, um, we said, let's take our bricks and we'll do the brick project at World Wood Day. So we had four days to build what we uh, looked as, we looked at it as a, a DNA structure. So it's two spiraling columns of wooden bricks that we had to uh, manipulate, mount, uh, and, and connect so that it would be one item when we were finished. Uh, it ended up having 290 some odd bricks. It was uh, 55 species of wood, 130 plus countries, where the bricks were made or came from. Uh, I know there's another s statistic in there, but uh, it's nine feet tall, and uh, it represents a lot. It represents a lot, of, a lot of hard work, but a lot of artistry from all over the world. And there's bricks in there from Uzbekistan, uh, Egypt, Israel, uh, almost every country you can think of. You know, if there's, if, if there's 130 countries represented in this sculpture, uh, that's more than half of the countries in the world right now. And there's the project finished with the team. Uh, 
the, the issue with egos didn't happen this year. It was 20 artists that worked together like, like a family. Uh, nobody stood out. Everyone was, was willing to participate and do their job, and uh, I think it was a huge, a huge success. Uh, there is also a, a documentary that goes along with that uh, project that, that is worth watching. It's about a half hour. So the last project happened this last March, and that was uh, here in, in the United States, in California. And unfortunately, I did not stay for the whole project. I, I was already committed to teach in Australia. Um, so on, world, on the day World Wood Day started, I had to leave. Uh, unfortunately, and leave the team behind. But this was the project that we built in California, and uh, it's five elements that are almost 12 feet high at the highest point. Uh, another team of 20 artists. Uh, five of us were uh, Americans, one being from Hawaii, and uh, myself from, from here, uh, and the rest from California. And the last project that I, I've done since then is um, I've taught collaboration for a class at Harvard. Uh, I was asked to, because of the projects, I was asked to join a, a class that started um, the beginning of last semester. And I worked for four different days with the students, with 15 students from Harvard. I went down to Harvard and met with them twice. And then they all came up here to Rockport, Maine and did a two-day work session at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship. And uh, there's a little video for that, too. I believe this course addresses a really critical issue for all of them. And it is the following. Uh, if you want to do something that matters, if you want to create, if you want to do something that requires an organization to be productive, then first you have to understand what it means to do something that matters. Then next you have to realize that it's almost unheard of for a single individual. I mean, there are some instances of this, but it's very hard to do something without the participation of you know, most of the things that we do that are really significant are collaborative activities. And they need to have that process modeled. They have to see what is it to try to create something in a collaborative environment. like and look like but not how we would present them so we spent a couple of hours planning that. Does anybody like six? Does anybody like six? Like like you know I thought for a second that David would just kind of say that the ship would be uh, this and we would do this but then we all like actually collaboratively decided uh, the form of the, the wooden platter. I mean it's always difficult having so many people try to agree on one idea. That was the biggest learning process for me it was just seeing how different people uh, 
share their ideas and come to a consensus about what's the best design. Aesthetically, you've just created this mishmash here. There's a lot of straight lines and a lot of circles, and when you put them all together, they don't work aesthetically. In collaboration, it is important to have someone of leadership, someone who is sort of not making decisions. It's not about the person making decisions, it's about them guiding the decisions being made by the group. There it is. Yeah. It's just set it up. Well, it's time to like bring the team together. Everybody gets something. You all get a present now. <laughs> First started, people um, didn't really know each other as well and weren't as comfortable. Um, this is again, you know, like really broke the ice. People like really bonded. We have a bunch of different personalities, but we all blend together relatively well. <laughs> and over the course, we've gotten to know each other in a way that it's never happened in any other of my courses. It's important that we all make things, whether it's putting words on paper, uh, music out of an instrument making something out of materials, whether it be wood, ceramics, whatever it is, I think it's important. It's an part, important part of our lives. So they're working on a documentary for that event as well. Uh, the t-shirt the thing was a very important sort of uh, discovery for me. I've done many classes, for, I'm sorry, I've done many classes where I've uh, ended the, the session, a week-long session, by having the class help me print a t-shirt. And it usually has something to do with what happened during the week, something fun or uh, something they learned. And uh, when we went to Turkey, I, I, two days before we went, we, I left to go to Turkey, I printed 42 color run t-shirts with a friend of mine, Ken Williams, in my basement. Um, and showed up with these t-shirts that we presented to everyone as soon as they had a plan on paper. And uh, the director from the program said, that was the best thing ever. And I said, yeah, it's a great way to bring people together. And so we've done that ever since. And this is the t-shirt that I designed for the project in, in California. So uh, uh, I stopped printing them in my basement, though. <laughs> and now he pays for them and somebody else prints them. So that, that was a, a great thing. And we did that for the students as well. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and the last project I just did was another collaboration. I just came back from teaching in France. And uh, it ended, it was a two week uh, teaching event. And then I finished up the third week with a French collaboration, which was called AFTAB. Uh, it's their, their association of wood artists. And I worked with 40 artists in multiple disciplines for five and a half days. And that was great. Unfortunately, I had to leave that one early too, so I didn't get to see all the projects finished or see the auction, but uh, it seemed like it was a huge success. That was a very different event though. That was a uh, free-for-all. That was come play and make whatever you want. So uh, hopefully I'll be involved in one more. I think I have one more large collaboration in me. Um, but we don't know where it is yet, and we probably won't until January. <laughs> and he'll probably say something like, Brazil. You know. Okay. Um, so that's all I have for images, but um, I'm happy to talk about any of the projects or any of the things we've, we've mentioned. Um, the one thing that I did, I did say I brought some pieces. Um, three of them are collaborations, and then there's a single piece of my work that actually just happens to be at my home because it's uh, a piece that's on the secondary market, so I'm holding on to it for a collector. But I also have four mallets there, and uh, the four mallets are from four of the projects that I've been on. So uh, whenever there's some free time on these projects, I try to get a piece of wood and make a mallet or make several mallets for the people on the team that didn't bring their mallets for carving. So being the one wood turner on the team, I would have the advantage of doing that. And so I said, well, I should make myself a mallet and bring it home. So I have uh, 
a mallet from Nepal, a mallet from China, a mallet from uh, Turkey, and a mallet from California now. And all, all of them but one is the woods from the projects, which is kind of cool. So, uh, questions? Yes, no. I just wonder who's underwriting this program? So, yeah, this is an interesting thing. So this guy, his name is Mike Howe. Uh, he lives in Taiwan most of the year, but also has some property in uh, California. And the first time I met him was in China. And he said to me, oh, I know where you live. I used to go to Bangor, Maine all the time. And I was like, really? I said, yeah. He used to, when he was in his 20s, he worked for his father, who was a... Uh, veneer log buyer in Taiwan. And so he would travel, he would actually fly to Minnesota in the winter, buy bird's eye veneer logs in Minnesota and then rent a car and sleep in the car on his way to Bangor and then buy logs in Bangor and then fly home after he purchased the materials they needed for the, the company. I think he inherited the company, had a love for wood, and didn't know what to do with all the money. So he started underwriting these projects. And uh, he, he gets sponsors as well, but I think the majority of the finances comes from his own family uh, wealth. Uh, and he's just, he, he thinks it's such a, such a great thing to have a World Wood Day. And I said to him, I said, so Mike, you have World Wood Day on March 21st. The UN doesn't recognize it, but it's it's March 21st. Why? He says, well, I thought it was the best day to, to have World Wood Day. I said, you know, I happen to know that it's your birthday. <laughs> I said, you know, if you changed it and it wasn't on your birthday, you could actually do World Wood Day in a lot of other places. Because the day he told me in Turkey, we were in Turkey for World Wood Day, and he said, so next year I think we're going to do World Wood Day in Moscow. And I said, no, you can't do World Wood Day in Moscow. It's going to be too cold. We were in Turkey doing our project, the bridge project, and I had an artist from the Philippines, I had an artist from um, Palau, and it was snowing the night we put the structure up. At midnight, we were all out there, and even I was cold. But these poor guys were freezing. And I said, you cannot do an event in Moscow and have guys from Palau come. So. Yeah, so that's where the, most of the funding comes from at this point. Yes, Chuck. You've, you've done a lot of work in your own studio, uh, but the context is markedly different in all these different places you go. Does that affect your work at all? Does it, or, or do you create your own little environment when you're working? I, so, I, if I understand your question correctly, you know, how much, how much is it? different from what I do when I'm traveling and doing these events. Every single time I travel and do an event, I learn something new that I go, oh, this is really good. Um, good example. So um, in, in California, I was uh, this driving force, just as one of the artists, not one of the leadership roles, to say, we have this material. I think something that's tall and standing would be great. Here's an idea that we've developed over the years from the first project. And we've had several artists that were on multiple projects. Um, and they agreed. They th said, this would be a good idea. We've never done this sort of standing stone type, monolithic type structure. And I said, here's an idea, but you can't use this one because this one I'm going to use. <laughs> so, so, you know, like I, I kind of said, if you really want to, use it. but. I hope you don't, because I think it's a good idea for my own work, and it's something to develop out of these projects. So uh, I, I, I hope that kind of answered the question. Well, scale, the scale is so different. You have the micro oh, yeah. and then the macro. Yeah. Well, and, and for my own work, which is that scale, small scale, uh, something that usually fits in your hands, um, I have this urge now to try to do some stuff that's bigger. Not quite 12 feet, uh, but I do have some plans and some designs in my sketchbook for bigger work now, uh, and and doing things that are more linear, not just sculptural, you know, curved lines and small and whatnot. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, so I think every time you do one of these things, it opens a, another door. Uh, another example is in France, one of the artists is an assemblage artist. She brought just metal parts of stuff. I mean, she had like 4,000 scissors there. And uh, one of the items in her pile of stuff was a pair of uh, big pruning shears for like your hedges. And they had to be 150 years old. And the handles, as soon as I picked them up, the handles just disintegrated. And I was like, oh man, this is perfect. <coughs> so we did make a, a sculpture out of them with, I think five artists were involved. Um, but the TSA yeah. loved her. Uh, well, that's, you know, everybody kept saying, uh, she was actually from France, so they didn't have to, you know, the TSA didn't get involved, but, but they kept saying, you're not taking those home, are you? I said, oh yeah, I'm gonna just put them under my arm and get on the plane. <laughs> you know, but, um, but I haven't seen that project finished yet. Uh, I haven't seen a photograph of it yet. Uh, but it opened up this idea, I'm thinking, oh, you know, old, old metal parts, I can do that. And I've done that in some of my work, but I didn't think of things like a big pair of shears. So now when I go to Liberty Tool, <laughs> I'm looking for different items. I, I do teach locally. Um, I've taught at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship several times. Um, I've also taught at Haystack um, six or seven times. Uh, recently just taught a Maine Crafts Association weekend at Haystack, which was in May, which is traditionally in May. Where is that? Where would you hear about that? Yeah. Uh, from the Maine Crafts Association website. That's one place you would hear about that. Um, they do a, a annual May event, which is a three and a half day workshop weekend, and they invite um, faculty from wherever they, you know, whoever they can get. Um, this last time, I think it was mostly main artists, but uh, printmaking, ceramics, um, wood, metals. Uh, there's a blacksmith shop and a hot glass shop there. So uh, you can also look up Haystack. Haystack has a, a good website for their, their courses, which is mostly uh, craft-related arts. Uh, Center for Furniture Craftsmanship is only wood, for the, well, for the most part, but, uh, but have, they have a wide variety of things that they, they offer there, from wood turning to furniture making to sharpening tools. Uh, there is also schools outside of Maine. Aramont is a school in Tennessee, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, which I've taught many times there. Similar to Haystack, uh, multidiscipline, and uh, a, a great place to go. Uh, not Gatlinburg, but the school. And, uh, and then there's a school in, in Colorado, Anderson Ranch, which I'll be teaching there in the end of August for a week. Uh, and that's also a, a similar type of school with a lot more of the what they consider the fine arts in their, in their uh, repertoire, so, yes? Uh, what woods do you prefer to use in your hand carving? So my, <clears throat> the majority of my own work is done in cherry. Cherry is sort of the middle of the road for me. So uh, I've experimented with many different materials and if, if, if it's a collaboration with someone, and they say, I can't do what you want to do in cherry. Uh, Hans Weisfog says, you know, I, I can't, a piece of cherry is not going to hold the, the structure that I'm going to create on the lathe. I said, all right, we'll use something harder, uh, you know, and I'll, and I'll have to take more time to work on my end, but that's okay. Uh, but if it's for my work specifically, I, I ex almost exclusively use cherry because it, it's not too hard, it's not too soft. If it's softer than cherry, it doesn't hold the crisp line I want. And if it's harder, it takes twice as long to carve it. And, and I'm not actually hand carving. Most of the work I'm doing is with a, I'm using a wood burner to sculpt the surface. So, um, and if you ever wanted to see that, you're welcome to give me a call and come by the studio and see what I'm doing. Uh, for those who like art, it's called a studio. For those who like to make things, it's called a shop. <laughs> Could you just briefly describe the process of collaboration with someone like uh, Bonnie, who's out in Washington State? Does, does the piece yeah. go back and forth a month? 
number of times, and who does what? Um, I've never had a piece go back and forth. Um, but the way I like to do single, like a collaboration with one or two people, is I like them to send me, so think about this. For me to collaborate with someone <clears throat> who does work like me is very difficult. So if they do a lot of color or piercing or texturing, I don't, I'm not gonna collaborate with them because it's just gonna be too busy, too much things <coughs> happening. But for somebody like Bonnie who makes a simplistic spin top that happens to be a box, I say, well, just send me one. Um, send me whatever you want. And that's a challenge for me. Um, in France, artists were coming up to me and saying, so what do you think you want to do here? And I said, do whatever you want. Give me the challenge of, you know, take the, the handles for the shears. I had a, wood, a young wood turner who said, I'll make the handles for the, for the pruning shears. I said, great. He said, what do you want? I said, I don't know, what do you want? So you, give, you make whatever you want, and then that gives me the challenge to see what I can do with it. So. In most cases, that's the way I look at it. Um, these bats, for example, they were a collaboration with a friend of mine, Mark Sphery from uh, Bucks County. Uh, he actually, would, he just retired from teaching there, Bucks County Community College. He's known for odd bats. He makes bats, what he calls bats, the rejects from the bat factory. So they usually have something funky about them. And uh, he sent me these three little bats with bumps on them. What the heck am I going to do with those? Within a half hour of taking them out of the box, I started working on the one because I had an idea, and it just, you know, it just grew. Um, the first one was the the, the bark one. I did the, the maple syrup bat, which was really interesting. So it went to an exhibit at the Louisville Suburb Museum, and people were looking at it, and you can't see it in this picture, but there's an actual antique maple syrup tap coming out the other side of the bat. And they kept looking at it and going, I don't understand. I said, well, it's the maple syrup tap. And they said, well, maple syrup comes out of a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. We're in Lug. <laughs> This was a this was a, a big eye opener for me working with a piece like this. I had to say, okay, I want to do something organic, but I want to keep the geometric form to this piece. And I never ever thought about wrapping an organic texture over a sharp edge. So if you see on the back edge there, the feathers actually go over this steep edge. I didn't change the form, I just had to make them fit that form. And from that point on, I started doing that in my own work where I could take a tile piece, like the piece that's here, the little tile structure, and wrap a, a more organic texture around that sharp edge and make it look like it belongs there. Um, and sometimes the material is not conducive to what I wanted to do. So this example, uh, the, the upper ladle, was a piece of ash. So I actually had to work with the grain structure to get the texture on so that it looked like it, it belonged there because the grain structure is so coarse for me to try to carve anything of, of great detail was almost impossible. So, uh, so that's part of the challenge as well. And, and how you manipulate it, how you change things, how you um, change the surface but don't change the form so much that it becomes different from what they sent you. Uh, well, and actually, if I go back here, uh, so Mike, Mike Lee from Hawaii is sending me these pod forms. Um, I did change the openings to his, what he sent me, because they were round openings. Uh, but I didn't change the, the sculptural object. I just thought that the, the opening needed to have an uh, asymmetrical look to it to fit the, the form better. And, uh, and this was the first time I did a collaboration where there was actually instruction back and forth. So because of the theme and because of what I had in my mind, I had to say to Bonnie, this is what I need you to do. And, and you know, I didn't, I didn't instruct, say, I want a baseball bat this big, I want a baseball this big. She really was confused because I said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with this, but this is what I'm thinking. So she just turned the parts 
sort of on my instruction, but with no, no measurements, no direction. And then I had to sort of figure out how it was all going together. For her, the, uh, the biggest thing was she kept saying to me, why do you want these little steps on the inside of the box top? And I just said, just don't worry about it. Just make them. <laughs> and it was because I wanted to make the bleachers. And I didn't want to have to turn that. I wanted it to be something that she did. Uh, and, and this was a similar kind of thing where we had to go back and forth. Uh, I also started saying to her, you know, you need to put a little more time into what you do. So why don't you do a little more? And so that's when she came up with the box inside the box, which was really fun. Um, and, and, you know, for a piece like the, the, the historical wood piece, um, looking at, at these, uh, she dictated sort of how much I could do to this piece. You know, I said to her, this is my idea. It's going to be monumental because there's a lot of monuments in the, in the area where we were going to be in Richmond, Virginia. Um, we both decided we could not do a north-south thing <laughs> in Richmond, Virginia. So we did the monuments and, uh, and I think it worked out pretty well. You know, so I, I was dictated by her forms pretty much. Uh, the only thing I really changed was if you see the, the, the pillar the pillar in the center is the only thing that I returned to uh, to make it fit what I wanted to do on the column, and the rest of it I, it was it was already there. So, did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Any, anyone else? Any other questions? Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I the hope video you uh, or two. They're really I think they're very moving. Um, you can just find them on the World Wood Day site or IWCS. So thank you. Thank you.